Okay, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and I want to thank everybody for being here for tonight's important debate. The 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge Series continues, and tonight is the much-anticipated debate between Dr. Dino and Ian Chen. Is there reasonable evidence for evolution? Ian, Kent, thank you so much for being here, gentlemen. And why don't we start off with some introductions, as we typically do, kind of break the ice, get to know the debaters a little bit. Kent, let's start with you, brother. How you been and what's going on? Well, thank you, sir. That's good to be with you again. Uh, my name's Kent Hovind. Uh, let's see where I'm in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles. We have a dinosaur adventure land, a science center, a museum, a theme park, all based on science and the Bible. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. God made everything in six days. He said in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in them is. He said he made it all, everything. I believe that. I believe the scientific evidence points that way. I taught high school science and math for 15 years. This is debate number 283 for me, I think. Um, I defend that position against all comers. And we're going to get Ian converted tonight. He's going to be a young earth creationist before it's over. We need some of them over in Australia. So I do believe the Bible is true. We put out a lot of videotapes in 42 languages on the topic of science in the Bible. You can get those on our website, drdino.com, or call 855-BIG-DINO, extension 1, to order. To call extension 3, you get me. Well, if I can answer the phone, I do all day long. So Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Those who teach the earth is billions of years old are calling Jesus a liar. They're welcome to do that, but they need to be alert to the fact that that's what they're doing, and I'm warning them it's not going to go well, Judgment Day. Said the same thing in Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of the creation, God made a male and female. The Bible says by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. If the Bible view is correct, God made a perfect world, man wrecked it. If the evolution theory is true, it all started with chaos and man is making it better. See, did the question is simple. Did man bring death into the world or did death bring man into the world? Which is what the evolution theory teaches. The Bible says Adam was the first man and Eve's the mother of all living. Jesus said the creation of Adam was when that was the beginning. The Bible says nothing died till man sinned. And the Bible says we all came from Adam and Eve. And Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Seth was 105 when Enos was born. And he was 90 when his kid was born. You can make a graph pretty simply, which I have here. And I'll send you one, Ian, if you want. Now you can have it for your placemat on your table when you eat breakfast. And notice, there's Kent Hovind again after me. <clears throat> uh, but the dates in the Bible clearly add up to about 4,000 B.C. or 6,000 years ago. Then there was a great big flood in the days of Noah, 4,400 years ago, and that flood explains all the geology that we see, all the layers, all the strata, all the fossils. Fossils aren't forming today anywhere, let alone in great quantities like trillions of them, but they're found all over the world. Petrified clams in the closed position. We've got hundreds and hundreds of them here in our museum. How do you get a petrified closed clam? You bury it alive quickly. Noah's flood did that. I think all fossils, or nearly all fossils, are from the flood in the days of Noah. The Bible dates add up to about 4,000 B.C., plus or minus, I don't know how much, a few years, okay? And Bible dates add up to 6,000, and dinosaurs and man always live together. Reptiles never stop growing, and before the flood, when the people lived to be 900, the reptiles would begin to be huge. That's the dinosaurs. Noah then took them on the ark, <clears throat> probably babies. They would eat less, uh, live longer, and produce less poop, and have less food to eat. And so I had, it's logical to bring babies of everything on the ark. After the flood, man killed most of them. They called them dragons. And for thousands of years, there are legends of people killing dragons. There could be some still alive. There have been a lot of reports in places like the Congo, Africa, where there seem to be some small dinosaurs still alive. We cover that on video number three of my series. Let's see. Dinosaurs still alive. Video series, uh, creation seminar series, 50 bucks for the whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> the evolution position is clearly calling the Bible a lie, it's calling Jesus a liar, and it's trusting conventional dating of fossils by the layers they're found in. All the layers are the same age. There is no geologic column anywhere. It doesn't exist anywhere. It's imagination. Actually, Kent, can... before you continue, brother, I just wanted to ask you are, you, are you going into your opening statement or just your intro? Well, I've been four minutes, my opening statement, so okay, we'll stop there. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to... You're okay to continue, uh, kid. I just... Yeah, you're, you're okay good. to continue. I got plenty. No yeah. problems at all. I got plenty. I, I, oh. 
That, that's my opening statement. I believe the Bible's true. Evolution's dumb and dangerous. Go ahead. Okay, well, I appreciate that, Kent. Let's consider <laughs> that kind of the intros, as in like uh, breaking the it's ice, fine, getting yeah. to know each other a little bit. And then, Ian, what we'll do is have you give your intro, but then your opening statement at the same time. And then yeah. whatever you take, just for your opening statement, we'll give Kent uh, equal time. Yeah, so let's perfect, say you take perfect. 12 minutes. Yeah. We'll have Kent uh, take 12 minutes as well. So for the audience's sake, though, I do want to go over the format and the structure for the evening. So we're going to be having uh, intros, which which we just did with Kent at least. Then we're going to have uh, equally timed opening statements, uh, roughly 12, 12 minutes. If Ian, you, you, you use a little bit more, that's fine. We'll, we'll give uh, Kent the same amount. Then we'll have rebuttals, let's say anywhere between six to eight minutes, and then an open discussion where the debaters will be discussing the topics, focusing on one topic at a time, and um, maintaining an equally timed discussion as much as possible. And then five minute closing statements and this is where we get you guys in the audience involved we're going to have an audience q a so please make sure you are tagging me with your questions at standing for truth and that way i won't miss them okay ian we're going to hand it over to you uh you can do your intro and your opening statement all at the same time so thank you for being here and the floor is all yours hey thanks very much for that uh, donnie can just just double checking can you guys see the share screen yes Right, excellent. And I did promise Kent, you know, back and forth in terms of the text that I'll try to bring something new and interesting. I know Kent's probably done like tens of these debates and it's probably a bit boring for Kent now. So hopefully I'll have something he's not heard of before, but I'll also have a few things I think that has been really discussed with Kent. So, you know, trying to keep it interesting. So in terms of my introduction, my name is Ian Chen. Um, that's not my wife. That's a picture of my wife, a little nod to, uh, to Kent and his humor there. Um, so I just want to kind of talk through a few things. That's my contact details at the bottom. If anyone wants to reach out to me for further information on anything that I kind of discussed today. Um, but I want to kind of make the point that the opinions here today are my own and not the views of my employer. I'm conducting this debate on my own personal time and not during uh, work hours. And I really wanted to kind of mention this because my last debate with Nephilim P, um, he tried to get me fired. So I just want to make it clear. These are my opinions. It's done on my own time. Nothing to do my work at all. I also want to thank Kent for the debate. I think in our back and forth in our messages, he mentioned that he had done, I think, over 280. I think he said 283. I mean, that's freaking amazing. 283 debates. And I think I think I can I can confidently say that I'm in the presence of a master debate, a master debater of such caliber. And I hope that after this debate today, that I, that'll help me polish my master debating skills. I also want to state that whilst the definition of scientific, whilst the scientific definition of evolution is a change in heritable characteristics of biological population over successful successive generations i will for the purpose of this debate accept kent's six levels of evolution so kent you can you can talk about it but i'm actually agreeing let's use your definition of, of of evolution your six different evolution and we'll take it from there i also want to note that i have a phd in biblical studies from rockville university um the website that i got it from is now defunct but i purchased it for 875 dollars so if kent wants to call me doctor i will certainly return the favor to him and I also want Kent to know that I will not be uh, taking assertions or statements as scientific evidence. I will only accept peer review scientific papers as the highest level of evidence. And I noticed that in Kent's introduction, he went through a whole bunch of biblical references. Sorry, Kent, biblical passages and, and references have no meaning to me and to me does not count as any evidence of any sort. Um, and I just want to point out that Kent, I know you like to look up Google and Wikipedia's evidence. So I Google Ken Hoven and I know that you're not going to agree with this content. So I want you to know that if you want me to accept Google sources, then you'll have to accept this content as well. So just a point to kind of note that, you know, keep it to peer reviewed scientific articles as the highest level of evidence. And that's uh, that's my introduction. I probably should note, Donnie, that um, I do have quite a lot of things that I do want to talk about. If you give me like a three minute warning, what I'll do is I'll cut it off there and I'll go straight to my conclusion as in the conclusion of my opening statement, if that makes sense. Any questions or should I move on to the opening statement? Hello? Hello? What's happened? Can you guys hear me? Hi, 
All right, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I stopped. I stopped here. Can you? I think there's a lag. Ian, you're good, man. You're good. I had to run upstairs real quick. It's your opening statement, so just. Oh, go good, ahead. good. I, I just was. I just wasn't <laughs> sure, mate. Sorry, sorry about that. Let me. Okay, let me um. Just, just do your opening statement, and you've got twelve minutes, so you're good. You're good. Okay, brilliant. Let me just share screen again. Sorry about that, and no uh, I'll kick it off. Uh, yeah, sorry about that confusion, guys. All right, you can see that opening statement. So I just want to point out to Kent that um, the debate topic today is: is there reasonable evidence for evolution? And I just want to kind of say that evolution is supported by almost every scientific discipline, over 100 of them. I've listed some of these down, could not fit it all into one slide, but I put down what I thought were the big were, were the big ones. And what I'll go through today is multiple lines of evidence from different scientific disciplines. And I'm trying to give evidences that I'm pretty sure Kent really dis discusses or is kind of new, new to him, just to keep it inter interesting for him and to the audience as well. Now, I know Kent will probably say, and, and, and cry out that we should be debating one topic at a time. So my question to Kent is really not each of these specific evidences, but really how is it that he as a young earth creationist, but with his belief, believes that all every evidence from over 100 scientific disciplines can be wrong. So I know I know Kent, um, mate, you, you are an unremarkable man. And what I mean by unremarkable, I don't mean it as an ad hominem. I mean that, that you are unremarkable to the science. You and I do not have any formal education or work experience in the science that we'll be discussing together uh, today. So um, how can you, as an unremarkable man, tell me that millions of PhDs across over 100 different scientific disciplines are wrong? How are you the only one that is right, but all these millions of research scientists are incorrect? That, to me, is, is absolutely not believable at all. Yaks literally believe in a giant conspiracy larger than what flat earthers do. And what I'll be showing today is a range of evidences, as I said, from uh, areas that maybe Kent has not heard or really dealt into as much in the past. I also want to point out that there are approximately 9 million research scientists in the world, and almost zero of them are young earth creationists. Now, the what, a bit of a joke coming up here, but Kent, I know you believe that I think I came from a rock, but you literally believe that. It's in your Bible. You know, God fashioned humans or Adam from clay. You literally believe that humans came from a rock. So, Kent, on the way back home, I stepped on a pebble. So I do apologize if I stepped on your cousin. If you can just pass on my apologies, that would be great. And, Kent, because I think you're a very hard man to convince that evolution is true, I've got a new name for you, and I'm going to call you Rock Hard Kent. My, my first line of evidence is really around genetics, and I'm going to be focusing on ALU sign, or short interspheres nuclear elements. But first I want to talk about transposons. Now, transposons are DNA sequences that can change its position within a genome, and it makes up 45% of the human genome, a really huge part of it. There are two classes of transposons. One, DNA transposons, they really act as a copy and paste. They copy strips of DNA and copies it to other parts of the chromosomes or even different chromosomes, and they make up about 3% of the human genome. Then there are retrotransposons that act as a cu cut and paste that make up 42% of the human genome. So below in the figure, you can see an example of this. Uh, a DNA, a retrotransposon will cut that three out on one side and place it in a different part of the chromosome. It's important to note that it's not also the same chromosome that it can place it in, but also different chromosomes as well. Now, specific on retrotransposons, which is, as you know, is 42% of the human genome, I want to talk about ALU signs, so short interpiers nuclear elements. And what I want to say here is that there are, they make up 11% of the human genome or 1.3 million insertions. Now, these are not ERVs, which we know are remnants of viruses, whilst, you know, you and Donnie obviously don't believe that. And they're about 250 or 300. We're talking about 1.3 million DNA insertions here. So a fair bit there. Now, most ALU in, uh, mutations occur in non-coding regions, and thus they have no discernible impact on humans at all. In fact, once they are inserted, they are rarely removed, and it, over 99% of them do nothing whatsoever. Those small 1% that are inserted in the coding regions, they can result in inherited diseases. 
and we identify ALU as the cause for things like some breast cancers, through to diabetes, Alzheimer's, even lung and gastric cancer as well. We've implicated ALU in over 50 diseases, including cancers. A very small few of them we have found to be beneficial, and we've seen some of them give improvements in endurance and strength, as well as responsible for three color visions in old world primates. Interestingly, when we look at ALUs, we cross-confirm DNA sequencing that was done in the 1950s that showed that chimpanzees were our closest relative to gorillas. And that's just another example of a cross-confirming um, scientific a cross confirmation between scientific disciplines. Now, a ALU insertions appears only in nuclear DNA, so therefore it's passed down to your offspring. So we can compare ALU insertions with other primates and we can work out a phylogeny tree because a shared ALU means a common ancestor. Now, as I said, there are 1.3 million ALUs, not the several hundred of ERVs that I share between primates, 1.3 million. They're the same size, the same insertions in exactly the same place and the same chromosome in all the different primates. Now, apart from the 5,000 or so that are specifically unique to Homo sapiens, they are all shared exactly the same with other primates. And you can see from the chart on the right how we can work out the common ancestor between the extent primates today based on the similarities of ALU. Now, the chances of 1.3 million insertions being in the exact same spot between Homo sapiens and different primates is more than finding one specific atom in all the atoms in the universe across 1 million different universes. Now, I know Yeks like to use big numbers like what are the chances of abiogenesis are forming or what are the chances of these exact fine tuning in the universe? Well, these odds are even less than that. So the chances of it being random obviously is not believable. Now, ALU insertions are so accurate that genetic tests can use it to pinpoint exactly where your ancestors are from down to specific locations. So we know by using a ALU insertions, for example, that North American Indians came from East Asian, East Asians, and they likely came across via the Bering Bridge. And we've cross-confirmed this with anthropological and archaeological evidence as well. Another example of evidences that are cross-confirmed uh, between different scientific dif uh, disciplines. You can see on the right there just an example of ALU. It's probably hard to kind of clearly see, but example of ALU insertions in Africa where you can kind of pinpoint which of these different countries your ancestors could come from uh, based on the common commonality of those ALU insertions. So my question to, to Kent really is simple. If he doesn't, if he can't, or maybe after we discuss why he believes that he knows more than 100 different scientific disciplines across 9 million research scientists that, that yeks are therefore correct, then we can focus on ALUs. And specifically, how does he explain ALU in a yek worldview? If he thinks God made them, why do 99% of them do nothing at all? If he thinks that there are errors, which I've heard him say about ERVs before, how do you get 1.3 million errors that are shared exactly the same between different primates? If he thinks that it's genetic degradation or genetic entropy, which I think Donnie, Donnie may, may kind of um, allude to in some cases, in some cases, then how are the majority of these ALU insertions in non-coding areas do nothing at all? And why is this degradation, in, in once again, in the exact same places in, across different primates? Now, we're talking about 1.3 million here. We're not talking about a handful. 1.3 million, exactly, exactly the same. Now, obviously, common ancestry easily explains this. My second piece of evidence, and I know Ken has said this before, and I promise after this, Ken, the, the other stuff will be fairly new. Um, so Rock Hard Kent believes there is no such thing as a geologic co column. Now he he should have a, he should talk to Andrew Snelling, who has a PhD at Answers in Genesis, who absolutely believes there is a geological column and that there are index force fossils as well. Now Rock Hard Kent has also stated that we don't know anything about the fossil except that it died. But actually, what we do know is we know a lot about the fossils. We know um, we know that, uh, for example, based on uh, their teeth. Uh, what they ate based on you know their morphology did they live mainly in land and water we sometimes find fossils with uh, skin impressions or fossilized food in the stomach uh, even where they are in the environment we, we can kind of deduce a whole bunch of stuff so we know more than just that it died now ken also says that phylogeny is just lines and paper totally misrepresenting the fact that we draw those lines based on countless evidence and data so whilst we do whilst i do agree with kent that a specific fossil we don't know whether they had children well, we definitely know that they had parents. So I'm going to show you guys in the audience some photos. And I know that Yeks don't understand science. And Rock Hard Kent and, an audi audi and his audience, I don't expect you to know the science at all. What I expect you to use are your eyeballs. Because I know Yeks, one thing that Yeks are good at is they have a PhD in eyeball science. So I'm going to show you some pictures. And I'm going to try and demonstrate phylogeny through these pictures. 
So the first picture here is basically the phylogeny, the, the basically the transition from birds to, from dinosaurs to birds. Now I want you to focus on the duck at the at the bottom left and just follow the line to through to the dinosaur on the top left. You can see through each small changes, its parents becoming more and more like the dinosaur on the top left. Now, given time, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll focus on, on wells as well. Once again, look at the well at the bottom and look at, at look at the successes, little changes that the parents will have. So it becomes a more marine adapted animal to a land adapted animal as well. You see the the the, the hole in the in top of the head slowly migrate to the to the uh, forward part of the head. The flippers kind of extending and becoming limbs and so forth. Now, what I kind of want to show the audience today is uh, look at the two skulls below. Now, ev evolution states that bears come from the Caniformia order, which basically translates to dog-like carnivores. And this, this order includes things like bears and seals. So question to Rock Hard Kent and the audience is, tell me which of this skull is a black bear and which of this skull is a harbor seal. Even Kurt Weiss from AIG says that seals are marine adapted bears. So use your eyeballs, guys. Look at it. Can you not see how similar some of these are? Even with the bears and seals, I know Kent will think there are different kinds, but look how exactly the same they are. Now, my next slide is around, my next piece of evidence is around archaeology. Now, according to AIG, Noah's flood occurred in, what, 2348 BC. And AIG uses radiometric dating, thermalescent dating, even oxid oxidizable carbon racial dating. I won't go into detail what these are, but they use these different dating methods to prove that the stories in the Bible are true. They they use it to date the Dead Sea Scrolls. They use it to show the kingdom of Judah existed. They, they use it to show that there was a destruction of Sodom and even the existence of King David. Now, if I were to use the exact same dating methods that AIG uses, well, we can we can see architecture and we can date those architecture. And there's a whole bunch of them that you can see listed now as happening before Noah's flood. So Ian, and before question, you continue, well, I, yeah. I apologize, Ian. You just hit the 11-minute no, no. mark. I, I just wanted to notify oh, you just hit the 11 okay, minute mark. Yes. I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to skip through so you guys will get a, a, a sense of the things I'm, I'm, I would like to talk about, but I'll maybe maybe for another debate. So oh, yeah, using no the rush. same dating methods. Oh, no. Thanks very much, for that, Donnie. Really appreciate it. So, guys, using the same dating methods that AIG themselves agree with, it's it's as if they've magically gone, well, if it's past the 6,000 years mark, it must be false. But we're using the same way they're dating it, the same evidence that they're using to date parts of the Bible and what's in the Bible is being true and dating other side, uh, other things like these architecture that basically shows it's how it all happened before Noah's flood. The one thing I do want to note though, is I've heard a, a video from, from Donnie talking about the, the pyramids of Giza and trying to retrofit that into the, the, um, the flood timeline. Well, there are five pyramids that are equally as large that was built before that can, but no one talks about that. So one of them is the pyramid of those are, you know, that, that looks like it could at least 300 years before Noah's flood. So that's just a point I wanted to make. So I'm going to skip to these uh, fairly quickly as well, given the time there. Human, human civilizations, a whole bunch of human civilizations that did not know that the flood was occurring. You can see where the flood is and everything on the left, anything basically from um, uh, the ancient Chinese to the South America Indus Valley to ancient Egypt to Sumerians, even the Australian Aboriginals at 50,000 years. So that, that's, a, that's a point I would have liked to cover. Same thing, using the same dating methods, cave paintings. We have cave paintings that were basically created before the universe was created. So that's interesting as, as well. And But the point I kind of want to kind of dwell on here is linguistics. So the Tower of Babel, according to AIG, occurred in 2242 BC. Yet we have evidence of pictographs and writings that occurred before that. Uh, Sumerian and Egyptian predominantly. And we have evidence of an ancient proto-language called Proto-Afro-Asiac that's been dated at 6,000 to 11,000 BC, of which the Egyptian language and Semitic uh, language today, where we have written evidence of, of uh, about a thousand years before the before the Tower of Babel, um, obviously that language occurred before the, I don't know, what, the creation of the universe. So once again, we can, we can have a chat about that as well. Um, I won't go through these slides to kind of say that we've had with that human migration and uh, how we know people migrated obviously don't fit a yet timeline. Um, this slide here is just a example of science that cross confirms different disciplines. We know the Austronesian language came from Taiwan and kind of migrated that down through to Southeast um, Asia and into the islands of Melanesia and Polynesia. We can see the exact same migration happening with empty DNA analysis. And we can see the exact same thing when we look at archaeological finds in terms of human migration. So this slide is really just, just to show how we cross confirm evidences by different scientific disciplines. And we just don't take basically what a book says. 
Now, what I do kind of want to say here is why am I doing this? And the reason I'm doing this is I came across an interesting stat I kind of want to share with people today. And that is fundamental Christians make up an extraordinary high percentage of the of people in the US federal of, of US federal population. 99.9% uh, .9 of criminals are religious, of which a fair bunch of that 57% are Christians. Atheists only make up 0.1% of that. During the same time, and these are data from the USA, you, during the same time, there were 3% of people who claimed that they were atheists in the USA. So I want to kind of marry this down to, you know, uh, numbers that I hope the audience understand. In the USA, 698 people per 100,000 are in jail. In Australia, that's 218 per 100,000. What's interesting thing is that USA has 4% of atheists and Australia has 30.1% atheists. So look, to me, if I just were to look at these facts, I would think the more or the less fundamental we are as a society, potentially One the less crimes. Yeah. So my last slide here, question for Kent. It's very simple. Explain why in a YEC worldview, um, every science across every scientific discipline, and over 100 of them, 9 million research scientists, why are you saying all of these are wrong? How is that even believable at all? But if, you know, if, if we discuss that and Kent wants to go into more detail, then I wanted to have a discussion on ALUs. So explain ALU sign elements in a YEC worldview. If he thinks God made them, why do 99% of them do nothing at all? If he thinks there are errors, how do you get 1.3 million errors shared exactly the same between Homo sapiens and all the other primates? If he thinks it's genetic entropy or genetic degradation, why is the majority of these ALU insertions in non-coding genes that do nothing at all? And how come the degradation is once again in the exact same place between humans and primates? And I want specific scan. I don't want vague hand gesturings or what you did with the ERV where you went to a, through a 30 minute um, video rebuttal. We spent 25 minutes defining what ERVs were and five minutes quoting from Bible passages. So we're going to get down and deep into this as well and try and pull the science out and maybe have a discussion of science. So I'll stop there and, and kind of thank uh, everyone for, for listening and their time and, and Kent as well. Okay. I appreciate it, Ian. That looks like it was about, um, I know you did your intro as well. So it was about 16 minutes in total. So let's say roughly um, maybe 13 or 14 minutes for the opening statement. Okay. Ian, Ian, I apologize about the minute there. I thought that was a good time to run up and get my coffee, but uh, apparently- No, no, no. Don't, don't, worry don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But I'm all good. I'm getting caffeinated here. So anyways, uh, we're going to hand it over to uh, Kent. Kent, uh, brother, it looks like uh, someone on your end might have muted yourself. So uh, we'll, we'll have to get somebody to unmute you there. And uh, we'll give you equal time, 13, 14 minutes, roughly that. <coughs> you're ready. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, I've requested over and over that we do one topic at a time. He brought up about 30 different topics. So I think that's kind of unfair. I'm not able to cover them all. So let's just pick the best one. And then at the end, he asked me questions about two of them. He brought up so many things. Let me just get a few of them here. Uh, let's see. Um, as far as him, he throws out all these numbers that so only, you know, 99% believe ABC. I, I don't believe those numbers, first of all, and that certainly wouldn't matter. I think you'd find 99% of all the scientists in Soviet Union believe in communism, because if you don't, you end up in Siberia or, or gone, disappear. I believe you'll find 99 or 90, probably 100% of all the scientists in uh, Iraq believe in Islam. It doesn't make it true. It just means that's a, the oppressive type of government. I think there's an oppression in this country against publishing in peer-reviewed journals if you don't believe in, in evolution. It just won't get published. And you won't get a job at a university if you don't follow the party line. So evolution is very similar uh, in this country as far as it's a squelching of opposition to communism or Islam in other countries that do the same thing. How many scientists in North Korea would dare to stand up and say, I don't believe in evolution, I don't believe in communism? There's a, there's a great oppression, I, I, it, it, that's another story, but it doesn't, the, number, the point is the numbers don't matter. What is the truth? The truth is nobody has ever seen a bird produce a non-bird. Birds make baby birds every time without exception. And yet you want to believe dinosaurs turned into birds. Nobody's, no farmer in the history of the world has ever seen a, any animal produce a different kind of offspring. You had images where you drew lines on paper connecting a dinosaur to a bird. Well, that's beautiful artwork, but that's not science. That's illusion. That's a magic trick. Oh, fool everybody. So the fact that you can draw lines on paper and say this one evolved from that one, nobody's ever seen any animal or plant 
produce offspring other than its kind. The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. Let's just stick with animals for now instead of plants to make it simpler. Every farmer in the history of the universe will tell you cows produce cows, horses produce horses. There are no exceptions. There are varieties within that kind. There are 250 varieties of cows now. Farmers have selectively bred cows. Some farmers want to get more beef, so they breed beef cattle. Some want to get more milk, and they breed toward more milk cattle. But they're still a cow, so they have, not, they have artificially selected a certain type of the gene code to, for their particular, uh, what, what do they want to grow, or, or raise? Same with sheep or anything else. Most of the varieties that we have today, like with dogs, for example, everybody's familiar with that, nearly all of the varieties of dog have been created by man for some particular purpose. Some have tried to emphasize speed, and they get the greyhound, and they race them, and they always try to breed the fastest ones and get them faster and faster. I'd be willing to predict, Ian, no matter how many times you crossbreed dogs, you will never get a dog that will go 500 miles an hour, or your metric system, okay? Uh, 800 kilometers per hour. I'd be willing to bet it'll never happen. There's a limit. And this is what you evolutionists do not understand or do not want to understand. Yes, there are varieties, certainly, but they're limited. They have rodeos where they have cows that they jump, jump cows over fences. F cowboy gets on there, puts a saddle on there and jumps the cow. I'd, I'd be willing to bet you could make your cow work out every day, lift weights, eat, eat nothing but the best grass and everything else. And you'll never get a cow that'll jump over the moon. There's a limit. I don't know if they've reached the limit or not, but that's what the Olympics and all the, you know, that kind of stuff is for, so who can break the record of anything, whether it's the fastest or the uh, lift the most weights or whatever, but there are limits. They have bodybuilders now that can lift hundreds of pounds, okay? They'll never get one that can lift 10 trillion tons. You guys, I don't see how you can't see it. There are variations, but they're limited. In your mind, a bacteria slowly got changes somehow, and turned into a human. You realize how much added information there would have to be? A bacteria doesn't have anything in his gene code for arms, or legs, or eyes, or hair, or none of, mutations only change or scramble existing information. They don't add any information. So change the bacteria to anything other than a bacteria would require quadrillions of additional bits of information, and it just doesn't happen. Evolution is a lie. It is supported by nothing but lies. And for you to say, all scientists believe in evolution, therefore it's true. Well, first place, I don't believe all scientists believe it, okay? Secondly, even if they did, that wouldn't make it true. That's not how truth is determined. Not by majority opinion. doesn't matter. You go by how many people are in prison in Australia versus over here, and that proves you got a better system. Well, maybe under, if you want to be under socialism, that's fine. Live wherever you want, okay? I don't. I'd rather live free. So, um, again, you made so many topics. Here's what's going to happen. He made, he made up, say, 15 topics or so during his speech. I'm going to answer as many as I can, and then he's going to say, aha, you didn't answer that one. Well, there isn't time. Pick one at a time, Ian, one at a time, and let's go through it. Okay, you mentioned uh, ALU, that these insertions. First of all, I don't know that that's correct, what you gave. You gave the data, and then I want everybody to assume that it's true. But let's assume that it is true that all the primates have these same insertions in the same location. And you yourself had on the screen that these ALU do almost nothing. Well, if they do nearly nothing, either we don't know what they do, or uh, they really do nothing. They're, they're leftover remnants of what man used to have, what used to use maybe. Maybe God created man perfect, and all the animals needed a certain uh, genetic code to do something. I think, how many lines of code are there for Microsoft Word? Hundreds of thousands, okay. Is there a chance that in Microsoft Word, some of the lines of code are no longer used? Yeah, they just, they don't use them anymore. So what does that mean? Nobody wrote the code? No. Uh, so your, your argument from um, lack of use is, is flawed on its surface. And about the fossils, you, you said, I, I've said frequently, and I'll say it again, when you find a fossil, you cannot prove it had any children. So you had up on the screen, well, we could prove it had parents. Well, I think that's correct. I'd be willing to bet you $5. This clam had parents that were clams. Nobody has ever seen, I lost my screen here. Okay, 
Nobody has ever seen a clam produce a non-clam. Never. If you wish to believe or imagine SpongeBob style that the clam came from an amoeba over millions of years, you can. The Bible says every 20 times in the first seven uh, chapters that the animals and plants will bring forth after their kind. Birds always have baby birds. We got all kinds of different birds here. We got parakeets and peacocks and pigeons. Uh, I don't know what all we got here. Emus. We had three emus. One wasn't very friendly. He ended up on the dinner table, and now the other two are very friendly. But they're going to bring forth after their kind. This is all anybody's ever seen. The word science means knowledge. It comes from the Latin word seer. What do we know? We know birds produce baby birds. That we know. We do not know they came from anything other than a mama and daddy bird. We don't know that. Uh, birds are mentioned all through the Bible. You don't accept Bible verses. That's fine. You will one day. But the idea that dinosaurs turned into birds is absolutely absurd. One of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity. It's a bird. It's a dinosaur. When a grown man dreams a T-Rex turned into a chicken, he needs some serious help. Scientists unveil missing link. Look, when you find a fossil, you don't know that that's a link between anything. Think about it. No fossil would count as evidence in a court of law. None. Breaking news. Dinosaurs turned into birds. They're pushing this propaganda since the late 90s, and people start to believe it. You, keep, you tell the lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. Hitler said that one. Missing link. Dinosaur bird. Yep, there we go. The missing link. National pornographic. Archaeoraptor. This is the propaganda pushed on kids, but this is not science. If you find a bird with unusual features in the fossil record, all you know is, I mean, as a fossil, there's no fossil record. If you find a fossil in China that, or anywhere that has unusual bird features, what should you conclude? You found an unusual bird. You don't know that it's a link between anything. This is how you, I don't see how you guys cannot get it. No fossils are going to count as evidence, and there is no fossil record. There's a lot of fossils. We have hundreds, probably thousands in our museum here in Lenox, Alabama. Come see them. Every one of them is dead. None of them talk. None of them have a date stamped on them. All of them, we'd have to put our interpretation on it. And you, you guys get this wild idea that you can tell the age of the fossils by which layer they come from. You, the crazy uh, index fossils, it's called. Oh, let's see. That's the wrong one. Wrong slide. Let's see. Right here. Two, two, five. Okay. Oh, DV. This is why I like to go one topic at a time. Uh, uh, Donnie, please enforce that from now on. Okay. Uh, geologic column does not exist anywhere. The guy who invented the stupid geologic column said his goal was to free the science from Moses, meaning he didn't like the idea of a flood. They made up these names, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, etc. It doesn't exist anywhere in the world except in the textbooks. They were all given names and index fossils. This guy in the, in the Scopes Monkey trial, the uh, atheist lawyer, said the lowest layers are obviously the oldest. Well, that's just plain stupid on its face. You think the top layer is younger? Then I'd like to ask you a simple question. Where is it coming from? Outer space? If you shuffle a deck of cards, Ian, the top card is not younger. All the cards are the same age. And shuffling the layers of dirt does not make one younger or older. There is no such thing as a geologic column. It's baloney. The geologic column, does it exist? No, not anywhere in the world. But you've, if you find a fossil, you will accept the date that somebody tells you because of the layer it came from. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting all these layers. Let me get to 289, enter. Polystrata fossils, there are thousands of them. Petrified trees that are standing. A tree is only going to stand up for a short time, a few years maybe. But yet petrified trees in the standing position are common all over the world. A bunch of them up in Tennessee, just north of here. So why on earth are we supposed to believe all these layers are, are different ages? It's not logical. So your, your, whole, your whole religion, Ian, and you have a religion, evolution is a religion, is based on the idea that the layers are different ages. That's your Bible. And it's not true. There is no geologic column. And I show in my video number four all kinds of evidence that the geologic column does not exist. All the layers formed quickly. Let's see. Petrified trees in the standing position are very common. So I disagree completely. As far as your uh, ALUs, I'll do some more research on that. The insertions, you're right. That's one I hadn't heard anybody use for evolution before. 
but I'll, I'll be ready next time. I'll have some more stuff together on that. Uh, but even if they all have common uh, insertions and a common uh, line of code, that's a common designer, not a common ancestor. That's the only thing you guys can think of. Wow, must be a common ancestor. No, could be common designer. The same guy designed them all. And maybe they used to have the same function. Maybe all the creatures used to be able to sense the magnetic field more and sense north and south. Maybe that's what they were for. I don't know. I'll find out. But thank you for bringing it up. I appreciate it. Go ahead. Okay, Ken, I appreciate that. That was uh, pretty well right on time. 15 minutes. So with the intros and opening statements, we have both uh, put in about uh, 14 to 16 minutes each. So I appreciate it. Let's do a, a couple rebuttals. And then we can really um, focus on the you know number of lines of evidence presented by Ian in some back and forth discussion. So yep. let's do a, a six minute rebuttal since the openings yep. were, were a little <clears throat> lengthy. And um, yep. I'll give you a one minute warning and then we'll go from there. So Ian, whenever you're ready, we'll give you yeah, six Yeah, perfect, minutes. perfect. So I just wanted to clarify and I apologize, uh, Kent, if this didn't come through clearly enough, but um, my only question really is that there are 100 different scientific disciplines that all show the earth is not young so how are you correct and millions of these scientists are, are wrong not just across one not just across geological column or evolution or whatever across 100 different scientific disciplines that was the main question and then what i then showed was evidences within those disciplines that we can we can then talk about if you want to um as to kind of show that it's not a young earth so that was my main question. And then I guess the second point was really to go on. Well, if you want to focus on a specific one, my big one was ALU, which you say you need to do more research, which is fine. So hey, before I kind of go into my proper rebuttal, I just want to ask Kent, you know, just two questions. Can you just define for myself and the audience? I know you kind of touched on it, but what is your definition of the word science? Well, the word science comes from the Latin word seer, mm -hmm. which means to know. What do we know? Mm -hmm. All through history, mm -hmm. science has been defined as what do we know by observation and experimentation sure. and testing. Yeah. Every experiment yeah. has shown dogs produce dogs. Every single one. No exceptions. So that's okay. science. That, that's, that's fine. So can you scientifically show me that creation occurred? No. I think it's the only logical answer, but I'm not asking that to be taught in taxpayer expense in all the school systems. You guys are demanding that your religion of evolution be taught by everybody. And paid for by everybody. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I get I get that, Kent. So probably a couple points uh, before I, I kind of maybe kind of rebut yours, what you specifically said there. Uh, firstly, whether or not you pay your taxes or whatnot is irrelevant to me because I'm in Australia. So it's got it's got nothing to do with my education system at all. Uh, secondly, and it's really just a point that I, I know you're kind of aware of, there is a challenge that Robert Beatty has for you to debate on him around the tax. I'll leave that up to you and him to work that through, but he just wanted me to kind of mention that with you. But my point here is that given that you've admitted that creation is, there is no scientific evidence for creation, after this debate, can I get your agreement that you will go and remove the word science from your organization, Creation Science Evangelism, and just rename it to Creation Evangelism, given that you just said there is no scientific evidence to creation at all. Can I get your agreement on that, Ken? Uh, absolutely not. <clears throat> all of these, right, okay. All of the science observation says dogs produce dogs. There had to be a designer. Ian, I want you to explain how this pen came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer. I want a purely naturalistic explanation for an ink pen. Can you give me one? Well, no, because we know that ink pens are made by man. You got it. Yes, yes, but we don't know that the universe was made by God. Anyway, so so let, let me just go through quickly this um this some some rebuttal. So and Ian, you, before you, you do, I, I I'm gonna pause the door. You got exactly three yeah. minutes for your rebuttal. That's okay, now I'll I'll be kind of quick anyway. So I just want to kind of say that I know Ken, you talked about the fact that the geological column does not exist. Can you please talk to Andrew Snelling from who has a PhD in geology in answers of Genesis? So it kind of suggests to me that if you if you study the topic like Andrew Snelling, who's a young lit creationist does, he agrees that there is a geologic column. So I hear what you say, but you probably need to speak to even a yek who is more informed on that topic to ask that particular yek why he believes a geological column exists as well. Now you mentioned a whole bunch of stuff around 99% um, of Soviet people believe in communism. That's fine. I mean, that, that that's not really science. 
but that's okay. That, that's more of a, a belief. But I do what kind of want to point out that as we know more and more about, about signs, we update our views of signs. So if you get sick, can, are you going to go and get um, – uh, what have you said before? Like your your blood kind of taken out? Is that is that something that you you're willing to kind of do, or are you going to go to a proper doctor with uh, the latest in medicine based on all the signs that we have discovered in the last four or five hundred years? As we know more, we improve, and it becomes less and less likely that what we know is actually wrong. And that's why I kind of believe in science. Now, the the whole point about ALU, um, if I can just spend the last minute or so uh, left on this one, and and if if you don't want to discuss this one, that's fine. We can move on to something different. But I just want to point out, you said that ALUs may or may not be true it's true I, I i am giving you what the scientific consensus is if you don't believe it that's fine once again i ask why should i trust you as opposed to people who have studied this topic their whole lives so uh, i'm just going to take it that what they tell me and what's in the scientific papers are correct now you say that god created AI, aaus and that's my point why did god create 99 percent of these AA, aaus that does absolutely nothing at all and why did they why did God build it exactly the same in exact same places as a gorilla or a chimpanzee and whatnot? What, why is it exactly the same between us and other primates? And we're not talking about the 250 to 260 ERVs that you discussed in the past. We're talking about 1.3 million exactly the same insertions of which I'm telling you 99% of them do nothing at all. And the 1% that do something tend to be deleterious. So I'll, I'll kind of stop there and kind of, kind of hand over to, to Ken. Okay, uh, Ian, that was your uh, six-minute rebuttal, and uh, <coughs> a portion of that uh, had you and Kent engaging, so that's fine, and let me just restart the timer. Uh, Kent, you have uh, six minutes of rebuttal, and, and you can do however you please with it. Go ahead. Well, thank you, sir. Once again, we have 10 topics on the field. I, well, I'm going to have to insist one topic at a time. Which one do you want? What's the most important one? Let's, let's just, uh, Donnie, let's just do the whole bait on just one topic like fossils, what do they prove? Or I, I, uh, ALUs, we can do that next time. Okay, now, he said there's 100 scientific disciplines, how could I be the only one that's right? Well, of course, his question has the built-in assumption that what he's saying is true. I don't think there's evidence from any of the scientific disciplines that show how any animal can produce a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog or a cow produce a non-cow. You can draw lines on paper and connect them back to an amoeba if you want, but that's not science. That's religion, that's artwork, that's deception. So all of science, all of observation, which comes from the Latin word seer, what do we know? By observations, experimentation, and testing. You can do all the experimentation you want. Every farmer in Australia will tell you, kangaroos produce kangaroos, without exception. No exception, you might get a big one or a little one, but you're gonna get a kangaroo, and I bet there's a limit to how big they can get. I bet you'll never get a kangaroo 50 feet tall. I, I'd, be, I'd be willing to bet money on that, there's a limit. You might selectively breed kangaroos till you get them 10 feet tall, maybe so. But you're not going to get a 50-footer. There's a limit. And you guys refuse to believe that there are limits to these changes. That's, and that's with selective breeding. Just in nature, most of the dogs that man has produced in the last 400 years would not survive in nature. If you turned all the chihuahuas loose in the woods, most of them wouldn't make it one day. The squirrels would eat them, okay? So, what? Okay, yeah, the, they wouldn't make it. So the fact that man has now been able to selectively breed down to a toy chihuahua, okay? I bet they'll never get one as big as a, as small as a flea. There's a limit how small a dog can get. There's a limit how big a dog can get. I don't know if we reach the limit or not, but they're probably getting pretty close. It's like with the racing the miles. It took them a long time to get under four minutes, the four minute mile. And so, but nobody's ever gonna get under one minute, not running on their feet. So there are limits. You guys refuse to accept that obvious scientific ev evidence. It's for everybody to see. Dogs produce dogs. Cows produce cows. No exceptions. None. So you said 100 scientific disciplines to uh, support evolution. I think you're mistaken. That's not true. You made that up. You might believe that. Somebody might have told you that, but it's not true. And even if it was, how can I be the only one that's right? How many times through history has been one person who said, look, this isn't right. We're going to change this. George Washington was bled to death by his doctors because all the doctors said, if you're sick, your blood's bad. Take out your blood. It was called the doctrine of humors. They were all wrong, all of them. Somebody said, hey, Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Let's not bleed people when they get sick. So the history, the science has a long history of the majority being totally wrong on things. And you yourself said, we like to change and improve. Well, good. Well, then change and improve your science to include the fact that we don't know how life got started, had to be a creator, had to be. 
the universe obviously can't be eternal because we see it burning up, winding down, everything. It had to have a beginning. And your ancient civilization, that would be a good one to take a whole other debate on, Donnie. The fact that they find civilization, somebody dates older than the flood, does not mean their date is correct. The fact that AIG uses carbon dating and stuff, I don't care what AIG does. I don't work for them. They're a good bunch. I like what they do. I, I recommend them, but I have no connection with them. I would disagree with them on multiple things. Uh, so, and the civilizations that they're finding and dating older than the flood, well, maybe some, something survived through the flood. Don't you think the stonework and stone walls and pyramids, what would a flood do to a pyramid? Get it wet. So they, they, so they date something older than the flood. But even then, Ian, the dates that you showed were just in a few thousand years. And you want to use this few thousand year difference to therefore extrapolate and believe in billions of years. I don't know if your government's as bad as ours, but they don't understand the difference between thousands and billions. There's a big difference. So <clears throat> we can do the civilization thing if you like. You said there's no scientific evidence for creation. I'm just saying I cannot prove, <clears throat> I cannot prove scientifically the creation, but I said that's the only logical alternative. If I'm walking through the woods and I find this laying on the ground, this ink pen, the only logical alternative or answer is somebody made it. There, there is no natural explanation available for how an ink pen can come to be. There just isn't one. Now I can try to imagine if I want. There is not a, a naturalistic explanation for how a single cell in your body could form itself. Ian, you probably have 100 trillion cells in your body. Each one of them has 100 trillion atoms. That's a whole bunch. And they're all arranged to work and move smoothly. I think that, and you are probably a copy off the DNA of your parents, which is a copy off of their parents and their parents. I bet since we are a copy off 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 a copy, going back probably 250 generations, it's amazing we can even sit here and talk about it. <clears throat> it's stunning. The replication process, the DNA code is so complex. How on earth can you think it happened by chance? If I was examining in a computer the, micro, the code for Microsoft Word and found thousands of lines of code and found, aha, look, at these five lines are never used. Therefore, nobody wrote this whole code. That's what you're doing with your uh, insertions here. You're saying, well, you don't do anything. Therefore, nobody wrote this whole code. This is absolutely insane. I feel sorry for you. Okay, time's up. But uh, <clears throat> why did God create the ALUs? I don't know. Like I said, there might have been a use for them in the past. It'd be pretty cool to be able to feel the magnetic field in the dark and know which way is north and south. Maybe they, maybe they had something like that. We don't have it anymore. Some animals do have that, you know. Maybe all the primates had it at one time and they lost it. Maybe that's a missing line of code that went bad. Okay, your turn. One topic, please. One topic. Donnie. <laughs> I got you, brother. Okay, appreciate the uh, rebuttals. Uh, lots of uh, points in the openings and, and rebuttals. Um, as we've we, we had a little longer, I think, uh, openings than usual. So I do appreciate it. What we'll do now is really focus in on the discussion on one point at a time. One, uh, Ian. There's a lot of background noise here. I'm just going to mute you for a second. No worries. No worries. Um, so what we're going to do is really just pick out uh, one of, of the many points brought up in the openings and and rebuttals, and uh, just go that way. We will discuss one at a time. Uh, since Kent just ended with his rebuttal, Ian, why don't we hand it over to you for the first point or the first topic that you'd like to discuss in terms of, yeah. of so the is debate? This, uh, this is a discussion round, is it? Is that is that where we're at? I'm sorry, I don't know, Donnie. This That's right. It's a back and forth. Right. Okay. That's right. Look, Kent, um, I must say, even your rebuttal, you brought many, many points up. So as Donnie suggested, I'll focus on one. And if you recall the slide that I can, you can't hear me. Can you can't hear me? He's asking you here. I, I certainly cannot understand you, brother. Please speak more clearly and loudly and talk, look at the <laughs> camera when you do. I'm, I'm not understanding most of what you're saying. <clears throat> okay, I'll try and speak slower and clear. Maybe it's the Aussie accent. Who knows? Who knows, mate? Um, all right, so I'm just going to say, just um, talk about one thing. And if you recall the photo that I, that I put up when I showed a bear and a seal fossil. So my question to you first, Kent, is do you think a bear and a seal are the same kind? A bear and what's the other word you're using? Seal. seal. A seal? Yeah. Uh, I, a bear and a seal have many similarities because they had a common designer. Are they the same kind? I don't know. Uh, I don't think they can. They, I don't think those animals care how we classify them. A bear and a seal do, do not. Do they don't interbreed. What they do don't mate. Think, so no, they, a bear and a seal are different, different kinds. Kind. 
Right. The Bible says that. Why did they? The Bible. I'm Sorry, trying to answer on, your Kate, question. Go Donnie. Yeah, go on. <clears throat> I'm trying to answer yeah. his question. The bear and the seal do not interbreed. They cannot bring forth. The Bible says they will bring forth after their kind. So no, a bear and a seal are not the same kind. The only similarities are because of a common designer. Go ahead, Ian. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, so this is just an example of different young earth creationists having different views. So Kurt Weiss from AIG himself says that a seal is the same kind as a bear. In fact, he calls it a marine adapted bear. And if you look at the fossil, the, the skulls that I showed, they look almost exactly the same. So that, that's just one point I wanted to kind of mention. Well, um, we won't talk about Donnie. Yep, yeah, go on. Go ahead, Ken. Okay. I know Kurt Wise. He's a friend of mine and AIG. I know some of the people there. I'm thrilled. I think they're wrong. You showed the skull. There's a whole lot more to both of those animals than a skull. The seal has flippers. Bears don't have flippers. So there are many similarities. Somebody may decide to classify both of them as a mammal. I don't think they care where we classify them. But I know this. If you turn them all loose into the woods, the male bears are not going to seek out the female seals. They're going to look for a female bear. And same with the seals. The male seals are going to look for a female seal. They're not going to look for a chicken or a duck. They, the, they bring forth after their kind. If you don't know if it's the same kind, ask the males of the species. They'll tell you. So no, bear and seal are not the same kind. AIG, if they believe that, they're wrong. Yeah, so Kurt Weiss himself said that, and I, I pulled that quote out. I'm sorry I wasn't able to kind of show that, but trust me, he did. So I think I'm going to revise my original and first question to you, um, Kent, which uh, I think you didn't answer, but you kind of said I went on a whole range of different topics. My first question as a reminder was, why are you correct and millions of scientists across many disciplines are wrong? I'm going to revise that a little bit to kind of also say, why are you correct and not just millions of secular scientists across a hundred scientific disciplines are wrong, but even other young earth questioners from organizations like AIG that have PhD degrees, why do you think they're also wrong as well? Because we have Kurt Weiss mm -hmm. saying that a bear and a seal are the same kind. We have Andrew Snelling saying that a geological column exists. They are both educated in their fields. So the question is, why do I believe you, Kent, who do not have a formal degree or work experience in those fields versus even another young earth creationist who has the education? Why are you correct? And they're wrong. And then extend that to why you are correct and millions of scientists who have spent years and their whole lives studying those specific scientific fields are also incorrect. That was my main and only question. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's, it's difficult. It's a heavy burden that I carry, Ian. Being right on everything all the time is, is difficult, but I've done so well for so long. I think I'll just keep it up. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I want to know the truth. The truth is dogs produce dogs, nothing else. Seals produce baby seals, nothing else, never. No examples yeah. in history, no examples in the world of this happening. As far as a degree and a legitimate topic, I bet you'd find all the PhD scientists in North Korea believe in communism. Therefore, communism is true by that logic. All the PhD scientists in Iraq believe in Islam. Therefore, Islam is true. It doesn't matter what all the scientists believe. That's just what is being taught. This changes from generation to generation. What is truth seems to change all the time. Like George Washington being bled by his doctors. All the medical scientists in those days, they got a PhD, they got a doctor's degree, and they taught your blood's bad, take your blood out. The his history is replete with evidence of examples of the majority being totally wrong. And the majority, first of all, you cannot say that it's 99% of scientists believe in evolution. It's more like 30% of the, of the people believe in evolution or less, maybe more in your country, but, it, but that wouldn't matter. Again, that's an argument for majority opinion. It's meaningless. So I appreciate uh, that you, know, you finally recognize that I'm right all the time, but that's fine. I did, then we'd both be wrong. So I'm not going to do that. So um, look, the number 99% was to do with ALU insertions and not to not on anything around most scientists believing in it. I think the statistic that I came across was 0.1% of research scientists believe in young earth. That's 0.1%. So 99.9% even, even worse than you think. Um, okay, so let, let, let's move on a little bit then. So you, you mentioned limits, okay? And, and I put up some photos of, um, you know, dinosaurs or birds, you know, going through the parent lineage, becoming what looks at more and more like um, avian dinosaurs. I showed uh, photographs of um, a well slowly becoming, you know, more and more uh, land adapted as we as we kind of go through their parent kind of lineage. So I want to ask you, Kent, where do you think the limits are? 
So, I, and I want some specifics on this. Not not some vague thing about a pig being the size of Texas. We all know that there are physical limits that are dictated by the law of physics that you can't break. A cow can obviously not jump over the moon because its muscles cannot produce enough energy to to basically overcome the force of gravity. So, not, nothing that I can already explain by physics being the limit. I want you to tell me where you think the limits are. Is it possible that a bird, the the bones on on the feathers of bird can become disarticulated so it's not a fused wing and have and then have claws on the wing and then slowly those feathers shrink the wing the wing shrink and it becomes you know a a, a claw of some sort w- without the wing side can that happen like where do you think these limits are and explain where these limits are without giving the rhetoric that that you always do that is clearly clearly rhetoric again i don't know if it's your accent or what but i'm understanding maybe 40 percent of what you're saying but uh, uh the birds could it uh, the bones be disarticulated and function? There are a lot of birds alive today, a lot of them, probably in the billions. Okay, does it, does anybody see it happen today, or are they looking at a fossil as the missing link? How do you know that mis- so so called missing link wasn't a whole type of creature that is now gone extinct? Just because it has slightly different bone structure than today's birds, maybe it's something that went extinct. It's not related at all. You don't know that any fossil is related to anything living today. You can imagine that if you'd like, but no, show me it happened in the laboratory. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Show me in the laboratory. There's a lot of lizards out there. I bet you got a bunch of lizards in your country. Turn one into a bird. Then I'll believe. It's to you, but I can't understand it for you. So, um, um, uh, how do I, where do I kind of go from you? So um, when I was asking the question around limits, what I wanted to know is through successful, successive little changes, can we make a limb, for example, turn into a flipper? So we talked about the bear and we talked about the seal. Now, the difference in the skeletal structure is almost the same. They've got the same number of bones and digits, etc. One just looks like a flipper on the outside because the bones are elongated and it's kind of shaped as a flipper, but they still have the same bones. So the question is, can a bear's paw, can that change through different small incremental changes so it becomes longer and it becomes a flipper? Do you think that that can happen? I mean, where's the limit that stops the bear's paw from changing into a seal's flipper? Well, we've never seen it happen. Nobody's ever seen a bear's paw turn into anything other than a bear's paw. I think you will find that the eight different varieties of bears in the world uh, might have had a common ancestor called a bear. And I think, I don't remember which one does have a slightly longer paw. Do you remember, Damien, from our science collection up there? Some bears, their, their hand is slightly, the paw is slightly longer than others. Okay, it's still a paw. It never turns into a flipper. So you can imagine that if you'd like. But I, and I don't think anybody would know what the limit is. You could ask the bears if you'd like, but I think they, they're pretty happy as is, and they seem to function just fine. So to say to, to them, is there a limit? What, what do we observe? Science is not what we imagine, it's what we observe. We observe bears make baby bears, without exception. And they never- So your definition, your definition of science is if you can see it happening today, that, that, that's what your definition of science is. Because what we have is we have fossils, we have skeletons, and we can date these fossils and skeletons through multiple different ways to tell us how old they are. And you know what, Ken? They provide a really great gradation, you know, between, you know, the examples of those pores becoming longer and, and, and just changing over time. All right. So my question to you is, is that evidence in your eyes? Because we can date these fossils. Now, I know you're probably going to say those dates are not true and stuff like that. Um, then the question then becomes is, why do you think it's not true? And and it's not just one particular radiometric dating that's incorrect. It's why do different types of ways that we can date a fossil, why do they why are they all incorrect? Because they're all showing a similar date. We use the ways of dating to date those fossils. We see the change and what I was trying to show in that picture between the bird and the dinosaur is if you go back to the parent lineage, you can see micro changes that kind of change and morph the physiology of that bird into what then looks like a theropod dinosaur. And it's all through successive changes over mil- tens and tens of millions of years. So my question, Ken, is what 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 do you want as evidence? Is it that you need to see it happen now? Is that your definition of evidence? Or will you accept that where we, where we use science to date something and then we can piece together the puzzle that shows exactly that picture I showed you of a bird becoming a theropod dinosaur. Well, you threw together about 20 assumptions before you asked your question. 
first of all, I don't think there is a geologic column. I think there are different layers. Would you answer my question before we go on about the geologic column? How do you get petrified trees standing up, connecting all these layers? How long does a dead tree stand up in Australia before it falls over? All right. So uh, a, petri a petrified. So we're going to come back to that question, Ken, but uh, I'll allow this digression. Um, so, you know, if you think there was a global flood, you would think that you would find these petrified uh, trees in everywhere. But why do we only ever find them in environments that are essentially swamp-like? As if a tree died in a swamp and that swamp kind of gets flooded and, and deposits silt and then, you know, the, the water disappears and it floods again and just continuously deposits silt until you see these layers that you're calling different strata. Now, I, I, I don't know the exact geological term, but um, I understood strata to mean things like a sandstone layer, a limestone layer, not the same kind of layer that uh, show differences within it, all right? So if, you, if there was a global flood, wouldn't you be finding these trees everywhere and not just in environments that we see that can explain the fact that these dead trees stand as over, you know, over the years still gets deposited in what you're seeing as layers today? So that's my answer. Well, you uh, that we you are imagining that it only only happens uh, one just one petrified tree standing up through all the layers would discredit the the layers being different ages. Sometimes they're, they're not different people. strata though, Kent. They're not different strata. They're not going through a limestone layer, a chalk layer, a volcano ash, or whatnot. Which is essentially, you know, what we define as the different uh, eras or the millions of years in between. They're going through the same layer, but those layers itself show annual differences. Whereas, you know, a flood happened, deposit a bunch of silt, the flood recedes. Next year, maybe another flood occurred, deposit another. So those are the layers that we're talking about. We're not talking about layers that go through different geological strata you know limestone chalk volcanoes that's not what you're showing i have pictures i can show you pictures and there's a bunch several of them up in tennessee they're still still standing there petrified trees running through a seam of coal and then many more layers of rock and then another seam of coal the mary lee and the blue creek formation of coal which are dated as being millions of years different in age but yet one tree connects them all of these layers that we see on the earth were laid down in one big flood rapidly, probably in one year, and then many of them were bent while the layers were all still soft. If these layers are different ages, when you try to bend rock, it's going to crack. These were all soft while they were being bent in these crazy shapes. They're found all over the world. It's not just one location, though one would prove the point. I think if the flood made all the layers rapidly, and then they all bent while they were soft and then hardened over the next few hundred years, that would easily explain it. But I know the Bible says the scoffers do not want to believe in the flood. That's their big objection. But I cover on my video series about the folded mountains and all this kind of stuff. But one tree standing up would, would destroy your geologic column. And you, I'd like you to answer the question. You say the layers are different ages. I know you believe that. Where is this, where is this next layer coming from, Ian? If it's moved from here to here, that's not a different age. Sh stacking your books on your desk does not make the top one younger. You just moved it to a new location. How is, is, are these new layers coming from outer space? Where are they coming from? If they're already on the earth being reshuffled and moved around by water or something, it's still the same age. It doesn't change the age. Why do you believe the top layer is younger than the bottom layer? Why do you believe that? Okay, Ken, so, so just on the topic of trees, I just want to point out that somewhere out there is a tree whose sole job it is is to replace the oxygen that you have wasted. After this debate, can I suggest you find it and apologize to it? Okay. So look, it's it's as me as as you believe that all matter in the universe was created by God at the same time. If that's the case, can can you tell me and can you tell me which of your children are younger and older? It's not about what what those layers are made from it's about how they are formed and how they are formed is basically how we date them so we know one layer is younger and older because they were formed differently and there were different radiometric isotopes that were kind of created as they were formed so we know that this particular layer is younger or older than another um so the question back to you ken if god created all matter at the same time how do you know that eric is i don't know actually is he older or younger than than kent andrews or your daughter how do you know that they're i mean they're all from the same same atoms aren't they I'm just not understanding the question here. Donnie, can you translate for me? Uh, how do I know what now? Say it slowly one more time. Okay, let, let, let me say it slowly. I'm, I'm sorry, Kent, um, about my accent, but I, I also don't speak redneck. Anyway, so um, so my, my, my question is simple. 
the the we the way we date the layers is based on how those layers are formed not by the atoms that sit in that layer and then i made an analogy towards how do you know which of your children are older and younger if god created the matter or the atoms at the same time because it is how they were formed so a volcano a volcanic lack, lack ash layer will have different radiometric isotopes that we can date then let's say a limestone layer that's how we know one is older than the other because of how it's formed and then the evidence it leaves behind as it's formed. So that's how we measure it. Does that make sense to you, Ken? I can't and really before you guys it can and, and before you guys continue, let's just make sure that, that the re remaining portion of, of the discussion here is, uh, you know, free from any little digs or insults or any, anything like that. But for the most part, uh, we've got a sophisticated discussion going on here. So I appreciate it. Okay, over to you, Kent, uh, for your response. Okay. Uh, I think he completely avoided my question. The fact that limestone forms differently than sandstone, et cetera. I live in a gravel pit, was donated to us, 140 acres, about what, 70 hectare. Uh, and it has hundreds of layers. And they all, we have layers of uh, gravel, sand, clay. Whether it's limestone or sandstone or slate or shale or uh, there's many different types of rock. How could they be different ages was my question. How it formed has nothing to do with it. If there's a limestone layer on top of a sandstone layer, and we know limestone forms differently than sandstone, is this limestone coming from outer space? How it formed has nothing to do with it, Ian. How, where did it come from? Do you agree, Kent, that when you have a layer and something appears on top of it, it is it, you make the assumption that what what came on top of it is probably younger than what was underneath no, it? No, do you, do you agree the with problem. that? In no, Ian, watch this. And, and I'm going to show. I'm going to shuffle these cards. Is that card younger because it's on top? Well, I mean, if you no. want to get specific to it, those those cards would have been made in succession. All right. So they weren't all created at the same time. So if there's a way to date when the machine made that particular ace of spades versus an ace of diamonds, then yes, you could probably tell if one is created younger or older than the other. Every speck of dirt on the planet is the same age, whether it's 6,000 yeah. or 6 trillion. Where is this top layer coming from? You're saying it's younger, but if you just got moved from over to the side to on top, it's not changing the age. How it forms is not changing the age. Your geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist. It's all made yeah, up. I think, I think what you're misunderstanding is, I think what you're misunderstanding, Ken, is you're, you're basically saying the dirt or the atoms are the same age. And I agree with that. They're all the same age. I mean, they came out from the Big Bang, so I get that. But... The configuration of that that makes a clay or volcano deposit, etc., they're different ages. We a volcano ash doesn't just pop by itself and occurs. It occurs because of magnet that's flowing from the ground and you know coming out, etc., or whatnot. So we can date that particular ash. We know whether that date is you know um, younger or older than let's say a limestone that was kind of formed. Now the atoms, if that's what you're saying, are all the same age. I, I, I'll give you that. The atoms are all the same age. I get that. But the configuration of the atoms that make up a particular layer, you can date how those configuration was created. Now one of the things that I think um, you mentioned before, Kent, that I kind of want to get your take on is you you talked about bent rock layers. Okay. Okay. So if bent rock layers occurred because it was folded during the global global flood when it was uh, when it was soft when the mud was soft. Can can you explain to me why we also see fossils in those bent rock layers also bent as well? It's almost as if when you have heat and pressure deep on the ground that that can cause deformation of the rock, and because the fossil was fossilized, it also bent along with it as well. So, if the global if the Noah's flood is correct, wouldn't you think that the bent rock layers would be bending? around the fossil that wouldn't be itself bent can you please explain that kid well we find the like this uh, piece of slate the man is holding in our museum is a pet piece of petrified wood running through 12 different layers of slate the layers of slate are conformed around the petrified wood yes i think the layers could form around things in the way like this one they found a fossil marine creature standing on its nose the nose is in a totally different layer, millions of years different in age than the one where the rest of the body is. It's the same creature. Did it balance on its nose for millions of years? The, what I'd like to get to, you to understand, Ian, your whole geologic column is the problem, not the solution. The best way to explain all these layers, one piece, one log going through two different seams of coal. I got pictures here a second ago. Um, 
two different seams of coal that are dated at different ages, but yet one tree is connecting them with a lot of layers of rock in between. Why would they name the layers of coal? Why would they give the ages different? The idea that all those layers are different ages is the problem. They're not. They can't be. They had to all form rapidly in one year. This top card is not younger than the rest of them. If you shake a jar of dirt and sand and rocks, it'll separate into layers. I got the thing on my table here someplace. Uh, here we go. If I flip this thing over, it'll make many layers. All the layers are the same age. They're all in the thing at the same time. There is no geologic column. And I know that's your Bible, and I know you, you believe in that, but it's baloney. You don't believe in my Bible. That's fine. You believe what you want. I don't believe in your Bible either. I think this will make 20 layers in less than two minutes. And all the layers are the same age. Your geological yeah, but those layers are not different. They're not different. So you're not actually, Ian, before layers. you respond, I just wanted yeah. to jump in here real quick, gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, the discussion has been moving so fast. The discussion portion, at least that I had, the agreed upon time ended about two and a half minutes ago. So I, I don't want to just cut it off mid topic. How much longer do you, uh, gentlemen, want? In oh, terms I'll leave it to Kent. Portion? You know, I'll leave it to Kent. If Rock Hard Kent wants to go for longer, that's fine with me. If he wants to end it, that, that's also fine as well. I didn't understand a single syllable of that, but I'd like to take audience questions now. Okay. Okay. So that was my question. The discussion, uh, the agreed upon discussion time ended two and a half minutes ago. So we will, uh, we will stick to the format as we do have just about 1 million questions that have come in from this very, very lively chat. It's been very hard to keep up with uh, the live chat and uh, the discussion, the, the discussion from Kent and uh, Ian but uh, I really enjoyed this. So thank you so much. And let's do, as we always do, let's have five minute concluding statements. Therefore, Kent and Ian can uh, wrap up their thoughts, wrap up their points uh, before we go into the audience Q&A. So let's start with you, Ian. Ian, you got five minutes. And right. I will, uh, whenever you're ready. I will share my, I'll share my screen again and let me know when you can see that. It's all good. You guys, you guys can see that? Yes, sir. Yes. Conclusion. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, so, uh, hey, can I just go one quick question for you? So I just want to know whether your ass gets jealous with the amount of feces that comes out of your mouth. I mean, that that was a whole bunch of gish gallop and, and unscientific assertions that I've ever heard, and it's actually all incorrect. So, yeah, anyway, yeah. hey, I just want to... Well, Ian, I just want to jump in because even I, even I didn't understand what, what that was. It, it, a little distortion there. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. Are, you asking, are you asking a question to Kent right now in your in your closing or no no what, so okay what, what what I said was I the basically the entire discussion was just Kent talking rubbish, um, making assertions that he didn't back and just basically him saying that I don't believe the scientific consensus I don't believe this but this is my view but not giving any reason as to why I should believe his view than any other view and then I made a little bit of a joke that and basically said does your ass get jealous of the amount of feces that comes out of your mouth. They're basically saying it's rubbish. Ken. Anyway, well, I mean, you can I hear that. that. Well, Ian, just say, I don't know if that's appropriate. In your opinion, Ken, is, is that an appropriate question or line of rhetoric? Well, no, it, that, uh, the feces coming out of my mouth. I mean, this is ad hominem. Come on, let's stick with be, be professional and scientific and enunciate and articulate, please. I don't understand what he's saying. Uh, there's a language barrier here. So I'll there is a language barrier. barrier. I don't... Well, Ian, just don't put me in that spot as moderator. I'm trying to be neutral. I'm trying to moderate a, a professional debate. Uh, you know, I, I think that might have been a, a step too far. We'll leave it up to the audience at that point. But let's just be respectful, sophisticated, and stick to, okay, the, point, to the point. Point, point taken. Point taken. Um, the only thing I wanted to say was I, I wanted evidence. That was all. Okay, so let's move to my conclusion. So, hey, guys, I just want to kind of explain why I think this, these kind of debates are important. And I want to show this with three examples. And I'm not saying that all fundamental Christians are wrong. There are some, actually some really nice ones I've met on YouTube. But apart from the fact that I've shown that there are there are a high percentage of um, criminals that are fundamental Christians, which I think is, is a, a strong correlation against maybe, maybe moving people out of a fundamental Christian mindset into more of a, dare I say it, atheistic kind of belief. So three examples. I want to talk about Ted Haggard. So he was one of the biggest evangelical pastors in the in the early 2000s. And he preached against homosexual behavior and family values, etc. And in November 2006, the Denver Police Department got a tip. They surrounded a hotel room and smashed the door open. 
And what they found was a naked teenage male on his knees in front of a naked and shocked Ted Haggard, who was found frozen in the upright position. All right, so that so this is a pastor who who preached against homosexual behavior that did not live up to what he preached. So it's kind of clear that uh, he liked not just the glass pipe but also the fleshy pipe. And here are examples of other pastors, fundamental Christians, that speak with one side of their mouth but actually have different behaviors as well. There's pedophilia happening here. There's you know pornography. There is you know a whole bunch of stuff that I don't think is appropriate if you are living and speaking about fundamental Christianity and not living it at all. So that's example number one that, you know, it's it's hypocritical. Number two, all around the world, even churches built on the highest mountains. There well, are Ian, let me just stop you. Mountains. Let me just stop you there, Ian, especially with yeah. that last slide. I, I, I don't know if, if that's all verified. And, you know, I don't want people to say that, that we're having. These are all verified all and they're got it from Wikipedia. This, this, is, this, is, this is completely uh, improper for any debate. I can point out all the atheists that have done evil things down through history, too. That does nothing to do with the truth. He's going way off track here. Where's the evidence for evolution? He's supposed the topic of the debate is, is there evidence for evolution? What which we have discussed, it has Ken. nothing to which do with which it. We have, which we have discussed, and also, Ken. What I'm Ian, that audience is, why well, just am a I? I'm, I'm going to talk here since I'm the moderator, okay? I've personally engaged in over 90 debates, and your concluding statement is supposed to be to wrap up your thoughts, wrap up the points. If there's anything left hanging that you wanted to address, that's what you do. You don't bring up new points like this. You don't bring up uh, arguments or... Um, slides like this that are that are questionable in terms of of the topic of, of the debate so are we going to wrap it up here or is, is there anything ian that you want to say in terms of wrapping up the points discussed in the debate itself sure um i'll 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 kind of pause there and kind of say that i don't think that kent um um rebutted anything that i kind of brought up uh, my main point to kent was and i will say it again but i know kent will then go to specifics my main point was simple I have many evidences across many different scientific dis uh, disciplines that show an older Earth. Now, I gave examples that showed, you know, that uh, that it, that it happened before a global flood or before the Tower of Babel, and I didn't give examples, and there are plenty of them that show an Earth that are billions of years old. All I wanted to show is there are scientific disciplines that do not agree with the yet timelines. How do I believe one unremarkable person like Kent, unremarkable being defined as not knowing the science or being educated in science, how can I believe one person like Kent over all these scientific people across a hundred different scientific disciplines and some of them also educated yaks as well why should i believe kent over them that was my main point and i gave them examples you know on different scientific disciplines that don't show a yak timeline that that kent kind of latched onto but didn't answer the main point i also then said if you wanted to talk specifically we can talk alus which kent said we can do another debate which is fine um because i think he needs to do more research so i'll, I'll kind of end it there but i do kind of want to say that this, these kind of debates are really important. From my perspective, it's about making the world a better place, and I don't think the world will be a better place if it's full of yaks. Okay, that is, well, that's five minutes on the dot. Uh, Ian, you're, uh, whoops, there we go, okay. Screen is uh, unshared, and uh, we're gonna hand it over to uh, Kent. You also have uh, five minutes for your concluding statement. Well, thank you, sir. I think we might have to do the next debate in writing because I have to, I'm not, my, my A, I'm getting old, my hearing's going bad, and B, the language barrier, but uh, why should he believe me? He shouldn't. He should believe the tr truth. The truth is cows produce cows. There are no exceptions to that, none. If you wish to believe and imagine that cows came from an amoeba, that's imagination. That's not science. Tell you what, get a laboratory full of amoeba and turn them into anything other than an amoeba. Nobody's ever been able to do that. They got a short generation time. It just doesn't happen. One of the evidences he went as he flew by with all of his so-called evidence was about the whale as evidence for evolution. They throw it out like just because they mentioned the word whale, ah, therefore evolution's true. The textbooks will say the whale has a vestigial pelvic and leg bone as useless vestiges. This is what Jeannie Scott teaches at the National Center for Indoctrination in Berserkley, California. They say, the National Center for Science Education says the whale is evidence of evolution. They say it has a pelvis and a leg bone. No, it does not. The whale has bones in what we would consider the hip area on most animals that are used in reproduction. But they say they have tiny hind limb bones that have no function. This was one of Ian's evidences. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. This is taught all over the place. Los Angeles Museum of Natural History has got a full skeleton of a whale hanging up there. Pretty cool. And they show these bones here, and they'll say, kids, look at this. 
the whale used to have a pelvis and a leg. No, that's not true. The whale still today has those bones, their anchor points for special muscles that allow the whales to reproduce. National Pornographic said millions of years ago, dolphins had legs, the same thing. Those are not hind leg bones, okay? They're lying to the kids or woefully stupid about their whale anatomy. Here's one of the bones in our museum right here. Has a nerve supply, a blood supply. This is part of the whale's anatomy to hold their giant penis, which can get up to 15 feet long. They got a mate in the dark underwater with no arms and they can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. It has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with making baby whales. So if you think the whale is evidence of evolution and you can draw lines on paper between a whale and something else, erase the line. All we've ever seen is whales make baby whales. Male and female whales have different bones in that area for different reasons, okay? So it is just simply not true. Stop teaching lies to the kids. I could go for two days on the whale anatomy if you would like, okay? So the, the evidence is that he pointed out all these, he said 100 scientific disciplines. I don't, I don't believe that for one second. But even if it's true, majority opinion is not how you determine truth. The truth is whales produce whales, fish produce fish, sharks produce sharks. There are no exceptions. So if he wishes to believe something else, that's fine. As far as me being the only one who knows the truth, that's not true, first of all. Millions of people agree with me 100% that God made the world. Millions of scientists agree with me that there's a God who made the world. And lots of scientists believe the Earth cannot possibly be billions of years old for lots of scientific reasons. But even if everybody did disagree, I wouldn't care. I want to know the truth. The truth is cows produce cows. Dogs produce dogs. No exceptions. None. So you can imagine and draw lines on paper connecting them. That's not science. Ian, if I'm right, I'll give you Pascal's wager here in the last minute. If I'm right, and there's a God, and he wrote a book, and he told us how he did it, and he made it in six days, and you die, what will happen to you? See, I can't lose. If your theory is right, and there's no God, and there's no heaven, there's no hell, I've had a wonderful life. I enjoy myself. I, I have a great time. Living good health. God's been good to me. I, well, I'll say nature's been good to me, if you want to call it that. I haven't lost a thing. I can't lose. If I'm right, I really win big time. If I'm wrong, I haven't lost a thing. If you're wrong, you've lost it all. You're going to stand before God one day. I have to tell you, as a preacher of the gospel, you're going to stand before God and answer for every word you've ever said, every thought you ever thunk. God's going to read it all back to you. And then it's going to be a judgment. And everybody's going to say, wow, this guy's guilty. Now, they could read all mine, too, and say, wow, Hoban's guilty. Yep, I sure am. But mines are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I'm going because of what he did for me. There is no evidence for evolution. I don't think you gave any other than majority opinion tonight. Where's the evidence? That's the purpose of the debate. Not what Jim Baker did. Where's the evidence for evolution? There's none. There isn't any. There's no evidence that this thing could make itself. Had to have a creator. I rest my case. There definitely is a language barrier, Kent, because I don't speak redneck, and all I heard was Hogan is guilty. Anyway, uh, look, um, we'll have to make a decision between, you know, what you said was I gave lots of evidence, and I, you know, basically one topic time versus what you just now said around I didn't give any evidence. So make up your mind, Kent. I guess audience questions now, I suppose. Well, let me just jump in here real quick. So that was supposed to be Kent's uh, closing. He was supposed to go second. And then we would get into audience questions. And, and you kind of snuck in a few things there, Ian. So uh, to be fair, let's hand it to Kent before oh, we go sorry, to the Kent, audience go on. go on, Kent. Go on, Kent. We'll give you the last word. No, I, I'm done. I'm done. I believe God made the world. We're going to stand before him one day. And uh, I think the evidence is overwhelming. There's a designer. But I'm ready for the questions. It's been almost two hours, Donnie. Let's go. Okay, guys, let's let's get right into these. Uh, what, what we're going to do is at least get these super chats in, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, start here with Candace Hamill. I appreciate the $20 super chat. And this question looks like it is for you, Ian. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian, most questions are for you. So you're in the hot I seat. It looks that. like. That's okay. That's all right. I'll do my best. Well, I appreciate you being a good sport. So here we go. Candace asks, how did nature or natural selection decide to make fingerprints, voices, and DNA different to be able to tell people apart? As, as Jordan from Reason of Doubt would probably say, look, I'm not a 
I don't know, biologists, or I'm not, not whatever this kind of science sits in, but if I were to hazard a guess, I would say that given that um, we, evolution uh, of humanity, we, we were successful because we live in social groups, that it becomes vital that we know and we can tell who are the, um, who are the people in our close social groups. So things like fingerprints, are, as I understand it, are folds of skin that, that comes from embryos, um, you know, um, that I can't explain, but things like voices, and DNA easily explained by the fact that we need to identify the people in our close social group if we can't see them, because that helps us as a society in that group, you know, do better than other groups, for example. In terms of DNA difference, I mean, isn't that isn't that what the Yaks also even say, that the fact that there are mutations and over time that the mutations will diverge, diverge to the fact that we're all going to be different in terms of DNA. Uh, each of those DNA obviously gives us characteristics that make each of us unique and different from each other. You guys believe we came from two people. I believe we came up from a population that evolved from other primates. Does that answer the question? I hope so. Sure. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Thank you, Ian, for the answer. We'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Dino. If you had a response, go ahead. Well, uh, that's a lame answer. It's important to know the difference. Therefore, we have different fingerprints. Uh, you would think this code is complicated as it is. It has to copy itself. Any, any serious errors in the copying process are fatal. Almost all mutations are harmful, noodle or, neutral, or fatal. Nobody's ever proven a good mutation. So if he wants to think mutation is going to make my fingerprints different than his fingerprints, I think that's, that's ludicrous. That wasn't an answer at all. Uh, it's important to know the individual. Yeah, I think God knows every individual. So not only th this question is right for Candace, good question there. We have different fingerprints, different DNA, different voices. Uh, there's facial, uh, they can do facial recognition with computers now. Every human being is different. It's amazing. You'd almost think God did it if you didn't want to avoid that. Do I get Thank the you, Kent. We'll, and, uh, yes, uh, Ian, the question is for you. So yeah. we'll, uh, so, we'll give you so the I, I think, word. Yeah, I think, Ken, uh, you should work on your listening skills maybe because I did say I can't explain the fingerprint. But even if I took the Yex explanation for it, you're going to have Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve reproduce and they share their – they combine the DNA and they come up with something unique and that keeps on happening and happening. So DNA will always be different even from the Yex view. The difference in the DNA gives me the characteristics that makes me look different from my brother, from my father, from my daughters, etc. So the fact that um, – so natural selection, even from – even if we started on your belief of, of two people, that clearly explains how DNA is different and how we can tell people apart. But like I said before, I, can't, I don't know the fingerprints. I don't know enough. As Jordan from Reason and Doubt would say, I'm not a biologist. Okay, thanks for the responses from the both of you. Next one comes in from Jungle Jargon, $5 Super Chat. Again, question is for you, Ian Chen. He asks, can you please show me vast amounts of programming being written by making mistakes? So as Ken would say here, in that question is an assumption. How do you know it's mistakes? So... Let, let, let's think of natural selection. Natural selection says there are DNA mutations. The ones that are delete, deleterious would be weeded out. The ones that are beneficial would stay. Most of them are neutral, but if you get a whole bunch of neutral ones that become deleterious, deleterious it's hard to pronounce, those will be weeded out as well. So when you say mistakes jungle jargon, those ones will be gone. The ones that are not mistakes are the ones that will continue and change and basically get adopted by the rest of the population. And most of them are probably not mistakes or beneficial at all in that there are so minor that natural selection can't see them. So I think you're making an assumption there that's incorrect by stating that it's A, it's a programming, and B, that the programming is a mistake. Okay, Ian, thanks for the response. And over to you, Kent, if you had a response. Go ahead. Well, you can take any paragraph written in English, like the one I just have up on the screen here, and notice it's made up of 26 letters of an English alphabet. Each of those letters as designed with different lines, you know, the letter A has two vertical or two angled lines and a horizontal one. This is not just ink on paper. I could spill ink on paper and the chances of it producing a single word is zero. Never going to happen, let alone a paragraph that makes sense. The DNA code is carrying information. It's not just the CADG, it's information. It's arranged in order that causes things that are amazing. So I don't know the answer, uh, jungle jargon. I cannot show you any vast amounts of programming being written by mistakes. I can't show you dro dropping toothpicks on paper. You might accidentally form a few letters of the alphabet by dropping a billion toothpicks. You might accidentally form an A or a T or an I or a Z. 
but you're never going to form Webster's Dictionary that way. And what we have with the DNA code is way more complicated than Webster's Dictionary. The code of one person, DNA code in one person, is more complex than all the internet code in the world. So the idea that it happened by chance is absolutely zero. It had to have a designer. There's no other logical explanation. Thank you, Kent. And Ian, you get the last word. Go ahead. So there's one thing that Kent is forgetting to mention, and that is uh, natural selection. So if I were to drop toothpicks on a paper and it forms an A and a T, and if we can show that those letters are beneficial to the paper, but let's, we're going to have to use some imagination here, then that's going to stay and everything else is going to go. And if you keep on dropping enough toothpicks, you're going to start forming words. And if the words don't make sense, that will go. So the words that start making sense, and as I'm saying, I'm alluding to natural selection as the process to do this as well. So Ken, don't take half the process of evolution and then just say it's false. Consider the fact that there is a mechanism out there that can basically uh, pass on the genes if it's beneficial to that organism and it's and the reproduction of that organism as well okay thank you gentlemen next question comes in from mitchell ten dollar super chat question is for believe it or not you ian again so the question is how many millions of years did it take fireflies to evolve the ability of flight and bioluminescence in synchronicity before maturing for replication so probably a couple points here. Uh, one point, I don't know whether uh, Mitchell was it. was Mitchell kind of heard me kind of say that uh, Ken and myself are unremarkable and that we do not know the science. So I, I, I don't know the specifics of this one. Uh, the second point, I do want to say that what a great epi what a great TV show Fly, Fly, Firefly was, and I'm very sad that it was only one season of it. So, yes, I wish we had millions of years of, of that TV show, but unfortunately we've only got one year. Look, look Mitchell, I don't, I don't know, but what I can say is, if the mutation caused the firefly to slowly glow in some way, and if that glow was beneficial to it um, reproducing more successfully than and a firefly that didn't glow, and over time that glow became bigger and bigger and bigger, then yes, I can definitely see natural selection as the mechanism to actually produce the fireflies that we see today. How long did it take? I don't know. Thank you, Ian, for your response. Mitchell, thanks for your question. And over to you, Kent, uh, for your response. I think you could take any animal, any insect, any plant, and really study it out and say, it's not possible for this to evolve. I did a whole series on that on our YouTube channel, Kent Hovind Official. How did this evolve? We went A through Z, started with something from the letter A and B. Firefly would be a great example. They can find each other in the dark, obviously, and they can tell if it's male or female by the flashing of the light. And they can flash in, and they can synchronize their flashes. The fact that they can do this bioluminescence is stunning. Let's see you do it. Let's see any human do such a thing. So it is, I think, the only logical answer is it had to be designed. However, I'm not requiring that everybody teach my theory of a designer to all the kids. Ian wants everybody to be forced to pay for everybody to learn his religion of evolution that says it just happened by chance. They, they, they can't allow a divine foot in the door, and I understand why completely. So I don't think there is a logical explanation for the firefly other than a creator. There's no logical explanation for this ink pen other than somebody made it. There's no logical explanation. There's no other explanation. I don't know who made it. Don't know where. I don't care. Somebody made it. Somebody made the firefly. Yeah. Okay, so I appreciate yeah, the yeah, response, yeah. Ken. Ian, you get the last word. Go ahead. Yeah, so my only point is with an ink pen, we know that there's an ink factory, whereas with the universe or evolution or however you want to define what God did, we don't know there's a God and we don't know how he created it. So there's a big fundamental difference there. And Mitchell, yes, look, I was just being honest, mate. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm not a biologist. I don't I don't know how long it took to um, to uh, evolve the ability for fireflies to have bioluminescence uh, set or even flight. What I do know is there is a mechanism in place that can select for genetic mutations that if they're a beneficial then it will um, pass on those benefits, uh, beneficial mutations to the offspring. And over time, that can create bioluminescence bio and uh, flight, et cetera. Okay, appreciate it. Let me get the next super chat here. Uh, questions are flying in. Okay, here is the next question. Comes in the form of a super chat. Brother Timothy, appreciate it. Question for Chen. Does he have DNA evidence to back up 
the bear slash seal claim that you guys were discussing in the discussion? So, brother Timothy, I put my um, just go back and rewind. I put my email address, so I put that in for anyone who had any further questions, etc. I do have um, uh, some analysis that kind of compares the similarities of the genome between these two, and it is very similar to the fact that it supports morphology, morph morphology, and uh, phylogenetically where seals and bears sit in terms of the California order the purpose of me putting those two skulls on the slide there was just to kind of use ux who like to look at things and basically say that that's the same to kind of say you tell me which one's a bear skull and which one's a seal skull because i think they're evolved from a common ancestor and that's why they look the same that that was the point of it but email me mate and i'll send you the papers that will show the genome comparisons between the two that will show that they are closely related appreciate it ian and over to you dr dino go ahead well, I was going to tr quickly try to look up how many chromosomes bear ha bears, grizzly bears have uh, 37 chromosomes. Hmm. How many chromosomes do seals have? Let me find out real quick here. Uh, uh, 32. So just on a quick quick look here, it, they they can't be the same. Uh, they're a different number of chromosomes. So 32 and 37. Something is different here. I think you'll find that the bear's paw is very different than a seal flipper. And if you wish to imagine that they have a common ancestor, that's fine, but it's not science. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Tell you what, get some bears, do all the testing you want to do, turn them into a seal. I want to see that. Selective breeding, turn the bear to a seal. Not going to happen. They were designed. Bears are designed to be the bears. And I think they probably like being bears like they are. Get to sleep all winter, huh, what a deal. Appreciate it, Kent. And Ian, quick final word. Yeah, so by that logic, Kent, um, I just quickly did a Google search of the, diff the two different species of, um, of zebras. Um, the plain zebras has 44 chromosomes. The mountain zebras have 32 chromosomes. So by your definition, they must be different kinds. They must be different. They can't even breed, et cetera. Obviously, that's not the case. So I think your example of chromosomes is probably not the correct example to how you define a kind at all. Okay, next question comes in from James Booth. I've got it up on screen. Thank you, James. Uh, question is for you there, Ian. He asks, if dinos are 65 million years old, how do you explain the blood and material, the biomaterials they have found in recent times? Yeah, can I suggest that James Booth kind of look further into this? They did not find blood. What they found, even Mary Schweitzer, who was the person that first discovered what could be organic materials in these dinosaur in these dinosaur fossils, and most of them were collagen, which are very high fibrous substances that you can believe would survive the test of time if it's in the right condition. They did not find, even she said that she could not definitively say that was blood. Now, when you hear a young creationist speak, it's as if it's a you know a raw meat that you can take out the the, the and put it put on the barbecue and eat it. That's not the case at all. They found structures that she thought could be similar to blood vessels, but they weren't blood itself. The only thing she found was things like collagen. Right? So we just got to be accurate when we hear young earth questioners say that they found blood and blood material. That's not the case at all. Okay, thank you, Ian. Over to you, Ken, if you had a response. Well, they've not only found uh, uh, blood vessels and that kind of thing, they found soft tissue. There have been quite a few found now in the last few years. I was trying to call my slides up, but I got about 48,000 slides now. Uh, but yes, many examples of soft tissue for dinosaurs have been found. Uh, none with feathers, okay? They're all skin. And so, but the, the whole point is moot. If some dinosaurs are still alive, we don't need to find any fossil tissue together. I think there's been overwhelming evidence I cover on my video number three, all the evidence that there might be in Africa and some other uh, places, some small dinosaurs still living. A uh, creature similar to Loch Ness Monster, for example. But there have been lots of examples. But if they are extinct now, they've just recently gone extinct because there have been examples all through history of people killing dragons. It was very common in the last 500 years to have stories of people killing dragons. I think that goes to people killing dinosaurs. They might have exterminated all of them. So we don't need to find. But I think if you Google dinosaur soft tissue, there's been a lot of it found. And I'll do it real quick here. But can we go to another question by then? Dinosaur soft tissue. Uh, I'd say 15 or 20 different examples, not just Mary Schweitzer's, okay? Yep, and is, is any of that blood, Kent? That's what my point was, was any of that blood, which was a specific question. Um, here we go. History.com. Scientists have found intact soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Hmm. 
I would say yeah. what, other soft, what other soft tissues that, that this yeah, is what but, I'm trying to get at. It's not blood. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't matter if it's blood soft tissue would still cause the same problem for you. Okay. Dinosaur blood found. Here we go. Smithsonian magazine. Hem is part of the hemoglobin, the protein that carries oxygen in the blood and gives blood cells. It got me real curious. This is an article. I didn't get to read the whole thing. Uh, blood so cells. You found, found, you found an article where they found a, some, some a molecule that sits in blood cells. Okay, I get you. That's, that's still not blood to me, but you found a molecule that, that's part of a blood cell. I've got it. Well, here's uh, BBC, bbc.com. Blood cells found in dinosaur fossils. Uh, so read past the headline. What does, what, does it, what does it say? I couldn't understand a word of that. Read past the headline because the headline is just to draw you in. What does the actual content say? I, what I'm trying to say is you are not going to find any article or papers that say they found blood cells. It does not exist. Okay. Well, you I don't I don't know that that's true. T-Rex blood. Nova Science Now has a video about it from Nova. T-Rex blood found. Uh, it's, it's a video clip. It's calling up a video. Just Google dinosaur blood. Find, find it for yourself. It doesn't matter, though. He's missing the point. Uh, the whole idea that evolution, that the dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, is ludicrous. Here's the, uh, I just opened it up. Nova Science from, what's the date on it here? We have lousy internet here in Lenox, Alabama. Uh, it's a four minute, 33 second long video. T-Rex blood. Nova Science Now. So can can we just agree to leave it to the audience to do their own investigation? Uh, can't because I, I can tell the audience that they're not going to find any evidence of blood. Yes, the closest you'll get is a molecule that was is part of a blood cell or even evidence that could be a blood vessel structure, but you're not going to find blood. And I agree with Kent. Let's just get the audience to spend some time later to, to research it for themselves. They'll show that I'm right. The, the one point I do want to end, though, is uh, Kent, I agree 100% with, with what Kent said. We do find small dinosaurs today. They're called chickens, and, um, you know, they, they're delicious with buffalo sauce and blue cheese. Oh, Ian, if they found dinosaur blood, fresh blood in a fossil. Then, if they found damn it, I'll have, to, I'll have to relook at, the, at what I believe about evolution. Yes, if you can show me Good. evidence okay. that they that's found. But, but, Ken, that's what I do. If you show me evidence that changes my worldview, I will absorb the evidence and see how I, you know, and basically see how it fits. All right, but what I'm telling you now is you're not going to find blood cells. Good luck. Good luck whoever wants to search for it. Good luck. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they have or haven't. I'll find out, and I'll be ready yeah. next time. But it, my yeah. point is it doesn't matter. There's so many other ways to prove dinosaurs lived with man, called them different names. And it's, maybe uh, maybe a debate topic on that. I was only answering that specific question about, about blood cells. Okay, okay let's know. move on here, guys. I'm mm -hmm. going to wrap it up with this last question because we are over the agreed upon 90 minutes. So uh, I appreciate everybody in the audience sending in their questions. If we were to get to all of them, we would be here till next week. So we're going to end it here. I had to pick a question that's most related to the topic. And since you guys did discuss the ALU sequences in the debate, uh, Brandon here has a question for... Uh, Ian Chen, he asks, can Ian explain why ALUs or ALUs are important for alternative splicing and even gene expression in the brain? Go ahead, Ian. I'm not prepared for that question. So anyway, um, I can't explain it, but I'll, I'll need to research this. But from my research, I could not find anything that said that ALUs um, were beneficial at all to an organism. So, Brandon, um, you've got my email. Send me, send me the papers or whatever that's saying this and let me have a look at it, and I will reply. Anyone that emails me, I will reply, and I'll need to delve in this further. But from what I could find, most of them do nothing at all. The, the, the 50 or so we've identified causes diseases, and only two that I could find could be termed as beneficial to the organism, and it did not include alternative splicing or even any influence of gene expression in the brain. Uh, Ian, and, and just to uh, help you out with that in case Brandon doesn't have the chance or opportunity to email you, here is a, a paper that I currently have in, in my repertoire of papers, Intronic ALUs Influence Alternative Splicing. So it is pretty well understood that these are vital and necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the but, cell. But don't, don't, respond, don't, 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 make, don't, yeah. So all I'd say is don't, don't do what I've heard that, that EX do, where they take one example, for example, ERVs, 
beneficial for giving birth or ERVs, beneficial for the immune system, and then extrapolate that to every single ERV. So you have found one example of, of a ALU insertion that did something that could be beneficial. Doesn't mean that the other 1.3 million are also beneficial. So just be careful with trying to make that dichotomy or that distinction. And that's certainly what I look at. So thank you for that. I will look at that. But you know, you've you've got the burden of proof. 1.3 million. Explain that if it's created. Okay, appreciate it, Ian. Uh, over to Kent. If you um, if you wanted to respond, go ahead, Dr. Diana. Yeah, I don't think we know all the uh, uses of the ALU. And as I said several times, it may be something that is no a code no longer used that would have been useful in the original creation. But putting a uh, if you put a, a seven year old in your um, new car and ask him what all the buttons on the dash do. He will have no clue what most of them do. Does that mean they don't do something? No, he just doesn't know. The fact that our scientists today do not know everything about what's all in the human gene code doesn't prove nobody wrote the code. It's like a bunch of seven-year-olds trying to figure out the buttons on a Cadillac. And it, as smart as our scientists are, they don't know everything about even the human body. There are amazing things about this body. I think it's time to say, wow, God, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to praise God for what he did. I don't have a problem praising God for this amazing body. I like it. Been living in it for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, Ian, final word. And this yeah, so is my, my, my thing is at, at least, at least with a car, if I use the car example. If I would have pressed the button, something happens. Now as a kid, I might not know what that, that, that is, but I press a button, the wipers move. I press a button, the light turns on, something happens. All right. What we know about the AL use is that it does nothing. It doesn't get expressed. No proteins are being formed. It does nothing at all. Okay, so that that that's my that's my I guess rebuttal. What Ken's saying, we know it doesn't do anything. Ninety nine percent of it, the one percent, they do bad things mainly, and there's a couple of good examples, and maybe three. I don't know. Okay, well that concludes the audience Q and A. Uh, you know, we don't seem to be very good at, at uh, getting these to the 90 minute mark, but we do have uh, over 300 people in the chat, a ton of great questions, and you guys had a pretty uh, good, engaging discussion. So again, thank you so much for doing this, uh, Dr. Dino, Ian Chen. Why don't we just have a, a quick final thoughts, final words, Ian, uh, real quick. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, First, firstly, thank, with? thank, thank you, Kent, um, for the time. And it's, it's been wonderful. And we can do another one that that's, that's good as well. I do want to say that I did kind of um, talk through quite a lot of evidences that kind of show a young earth. Uh, there is many more than what I've kind of talked through. And can I suggest if anyone's interested, James Downer and, and Jackson Wheat has written a book. It goes through tons more evidences of why evolution is true and why we know the earth is, is not young. So if you guys are interested, I suggest you get this book and have a read. It's really chunky. Thanks, Sammy. Thank you, Ian. And uh, Kent, over to you. Final thoughts, final words. Thank you for doing this. Well, the rocks were there, but they don't talk. We're putting our interpretation on them. The textbooks consistently teach that, you know, in a protozoa turned to a biology teacher, they make these trees of life by drawing lines on paper, connecting all these different creatures. So, Ian, this book shows... Um, um, an octopus having a line on paper back to a common ancestor with a human. Ian, do you believe you are related to an octopus? I believe all life is, yeah, so I believe all life is related. There's a common ancestor. There would be millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years ago. Yes, there was a common ancestor between octopus and humans. And yes, I know you're going to go and, and, and make fun of me based on that. But if we believe in common ancestry, then you can make any sort of example between a strawberry, a mushroom or whatever. We all came from a universal life, common life form. My, my point would be we do see varieties of horses. We see varieties of dogs. We see varieties of strawberries. We do not see anything ever produce other than its kind. This chart shows horses being related to uh, monkeys and kangaroos. They drew a line on paper. To long connect time ago, Ken. Yes, long time ago. Oh, long yeah, time. Time, time yeah. will solve the problem. See, time yeah. is your time is your god. That's your savior. Time's going to save you science. from all the idiocy. Proven by science. All the many forms of life are descended from a common ancestor, a primitive unicellular organism. This you got it, Ken. We, we can convert you soon. You've got it. You're starting to understand it. Just take the last step. You're an evolutionist. I believe it's my turn to talk. Uh, there is no evidence for this at all. The none. Nobody's ever seen a crocodile produce a non-crocodile. It is pure religious speculation inside this circle right here. 
It's imagination. It's not science. Science is what we can observe and study and test. Birds make baby birds every time. And you guys who believe that birds and crocodiles are related should keep your religion out of the school system. Teach it to your kids at home if they want to learn it. But hopefully they'll get a set of my videotapes and unlearn how, and learn how dumb that is and learn uh, more reasons why evolution is stupid. It is stupid. Evolution is stupid. Lies in the textbooks. Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. I have a whole series of videos on my YouTube channel, my YouTube, Kent Hovind Official, and my bookstore, uh, drdino.com, D-R-D-I-N-O, or come visit Lenox, Alabama, in straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles. You can take the tour of our ministry. Ian, come on over, and we'll give you the tour of the place. You'll enjoy it. Get you converted while if you're I, there, too. If I'm around there, I will definitely want to come and at least meet you in person. So um, I'm not sure if I'll be around there. Lenox, Alabama, I've never heard of it. Um, but if I am around there, I will accept the invitation, and thank you for extending the invite. You're welcome. Anytime. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. Dr. Dino, Ian, thanks for your final words to the audience. Thanks for tuning in. We are exactly at the two hour mark. So we are going to end it here. Guys, thanks again. Standing for Truth is out. He's out. <laughs>
And uh, we are making these roughly 30 to 40 minutes long. We've done two. I did one a few days ago on recombination rates. And Professor McQueen did one uh, just last night. It, it is uploaded now on copper creation and the worldwide flood. We've also got the sequel, Ken Rock and Dr. Ken Hoven for next month, including a debate with Rune Norderhog next month as well. The Evolution Debate Challenge series continues. And this Saturday, last uh, event I want to mention, and again, this is just a snapshot of what we have uh, currently scheduled on Standing for Truth Ministries. So make sure you're subscribed, hit the like button, hit the notification bell, and uh, check the event section, guys. Or check the website, standfortruthministries.com. Endless content, endless content. We did an April update, and uh, there is a ton for you guys to check out. So we are going to be having Dr. Jerry Bergman back here on Saturday, Evidence for Evolution or Biblical Creation. Uh, we are going to be given uh, a presentation, a talk by a Jerry, and then we are going to uh, have an audience Q&A. We're going to make it interactive. So uh, I think that's about it. Tom, brother, good to see you. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, Kevin's biblical discussion. I appreciate that. Okay, guys, until, until we meet again, um, which will be this Friday at, uh, I believe it's 930 between Kelly Powers and Rodney Smith. So thank you again for tuning in. And uh, this time for real, Standing for Truth is out. <laughs>